Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to start a series of lectures on 19th century reforms. Uh, first thing you got to understand is what 19th century means. Uh, 19th century is the uh, 1800s. So uh, you know, from previous lectures, we have kind of talked about uh, what is changing in society in the 1800s. Uh, we see that, you know, we're expanding west. Uh, that is going to, you know, kind of create some more sectionalism problems, you know, as we expand west. Are we, uh, you know, going to add states as free states or slave states? Uh, we're seeing the growth in manufacturing, although we are still primarily agricultural, still farming. Uh, as manufacturing grows, we're seeing the growth of cities, uh, which is going to have a kind of a series of problems with poverty and crime and with crime in the prison system uh, where, you know, uh, health care issues uh, because the, the living conditions in cities are, are really poor and there's no regulation there. You know, uh, so, you know, these things uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, because of the expansion West, we're going to see growing rates of alcoholism uh, in the United States because, you know, as you know, the farms get further and further away from the cities. Uh, the ability to get crops from the farms to the cities becomes more difficult. It'll rot on the way. There's no refrigeration, right? There's no highway system. You can't fly it out to the cities. It takes forever to get that stuff to the cities. So it rots. So what do farmers do? Well, they can take their crop and they can turn it into alcohol. And so uh, we see, uh, you know, a rise in liquor consumptions, uh, which is going to be an issue. We're seeing a growing population uh, that doesn't have access to education. So we're seeing high illiteracy rates uh, and we just we're, we're having all these problems in the 1800s. Now, don't get me wrong. America's not a bad place to live at the, at the time. There's all kinds of opportunity. If you're poor, there's free land out west. Uh, there's growing numbers of jobs. Women are starting. And i would be clear here. Uh, women are starting to work in the, the workforce, but it's going to take a very long time before, uh, you know, the it's acceptable really for, for women to, to be in the workforce. But, you know, all these kind of things, you know, we're, we're building universities like crazy across the country. So things are, are moving in the right direction for America. They're just not moving as fast as, uh, you know, they probably should. And so we, we're, we have all these issues and uh, we're going to start to deal with them primarily because of the middle class, right? The middle class is in this unique kind of position uh, in the United States. You know, the because we have this growing middle class and we're, we, we have this um, emerging economy, uh, you know, people are really going to start to believe that reform is actually possible. Uh, you know, we we have this, uh, you know, American ideal uh, that, you know, in America, you, you can change, you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, and, you know, and, and that is true. I, that gets a lot of criticism today, uh, but it's really kind of unfounded. Uh, you know, the, the reality is, uh, you know, people are constantly uh, increasing their economic uh, status. I mean, I read an article the other day that uh, roughly 88% of the millionaires in America are first generation and self-made. Uh, which means they didn't inherit any money. Uh, you know, in, in, when you look at the, the top wealth earners, everybody believes that the top, the richest people, the top 1%, that that's static, that those people have been rich, they've always been rich, and they just control all the money. Well, the reality is about 10% of us will at some point make it into the top 1%. Uh, and about 50% of us are one day going to earn enough money to make us, uh, to get us into the top 10% of wealth earners in America, right? There's more social mobility here than anywhere else on the planet. And with that comes this belief that change is possible. We can change, we can reform. And so if the situation is bad for you individually or bad for a society, um, we actually have the ability to change, which is a relatively new concept, right? Uh, you know, before the 1800s, most religious belief believed in an idea of, that was called predetermination, that it's God has already determined what's going to happen to everybody, right? Which means when you're born, God has decided if you're good or bad. And you can't change that because it's God's will. And that's what people believe. Well, if people believed that, that, that God made you either good or bad, right? And you can't change that. Is there any chance that you're even going to try? 
Probably not. So if you're poor, why uh, take risks and why, uh, you know, try and get an education? Because if you're poor, God meant you to be poor. There's no reason to change. Right. If, you know, you are young and you make a few mistakes and you get yourself in trouble with the law, if you believe in predetermination, then you believe, well, God made me bad. Uh, I'm always going to be bad and I should never even bother to try to be good. Well, what's going to happen in the 1800s is people are going to look around and they're going to look at the rise of the middle class and that these people went from poor to the middle class and the people in the middle class went from middle class to build gigantic fortunes. They're going to say, hey, wait, people can change. And maybe predetermination is bogus. Maybe God gave us free will. And if he gave us free will, we have to choose to be good or choose to be bad right? We have to choose to work hard and save money and, and do those things if we want to make it in the middle class. And it's not just God's will. And so religion really starts to change uh, because of the Protestant revival uh, and the second great awakening that's going to change the way that religion approaches society. And the, the, the great part about this rejection of predetermination that the Puritans really promoted, uh, the if you as an individual can change, and this is important, it's giving me chills, right? Uh, if you as an individual can change, that also means society can change. That's huge because early on in American, uh, you know, religious thought, the belief was, well, if people are good or bad because God determined it, then that also means countries are good or bad because God determined it. And if something's wrong with our country, well, God wanted it that way. And who are we to try to change that? Right. And so if there's problems with the literacy, well, that's the way God wanted it. And so I'm not going to spend any time to try and fix it. Well, when we start to reject predetermination, we start to realize, well, God gave us all free will and I have to choose to be good. And if I have to choose to be good, doesn't it then uh, isn't it then important for me to try to make society better as well, right? And so rejecting predetermination does that. It also does something uh, for, uh, you know, uh, foreign policy as well, because if, if you know, people choose to be good and bad and countries can choose to be good and bad, uh, the it, it's a little bit harder to vilify foreign countries. Now, we're still going to do that, uh, clearly, uh, but it becomes a little bit harder. So uh, one of the uh, leaders of this movement is going to be Charles Granderson Finney. Uh, he's a Presbyterian minister, uh, and he really kind of starts this movement in New York. He, he essentially says, you know, uh, God has not predetermined things, that he has given you free will, and that if you want to be a good person, you can be a good person. You can change, which means you have to look at all these problems that society has. Uh, you have to you know, look at illiteracy and say that is a problem and we need to uh, provide education to people who haven't had access to it uh, to make their lives better. And that will help make me a good person. That will help make society a good person. We need to, uh, you know, tackle alcoholism and, you know, figure out a way to, you know, try and, uh, you know, get people to, uh, you know, not be alcoholics. And, you know, that would, that will, help society be better. Uh, we're going to have to tackle the issue of slavery. Now, Finney is uh, eventually going to go on to become the president of a very important university, uh, Oberlin College. Uh, and so Oberlin College is super important for a number of reasons. Uh, it is uh, going to be one of the first integrated uh, colleges in the country. It's going to allow in whites and blacks and, and men and women. Uh, and so this happens, you know, way before that is uh, that is the norm. Uh, and Finney is going to use Oberlin uh, College as a stop on the Underground Railroad. So Finney, I mean, think about what predetermination means or the rejection of predetermination means. It means that you know, you have to decide to be good or bad, which means actions become important. And so you can't just say, I'm against slavery, right? Finney says, I'm against slavery, and now I'm obligated to do something about it. 
right? And so he opens up Oberlin College, and when slaves are running away, uh, they they know they can go to Oberlin College. Uh, Oberlin College will hide them, feed them, and then help get them to you know northern col- colonies, uh, you know in uh, you know uh, no, I shouldn't say colonies. Uh, in northern cities like Philadelphia that really do a good job of uh, of, of protecting runaway slaves or send them on the way to uh, to Canada. And so, you know, the, this university ends up becoming, uh, you know, uh, vitally important to American history and kind of defeats this narrative. We've done a very bad job as history teachers uh, when it comes to discussing, I think, some of these major issues in America, I, I, I think we, we tend to tell this story. And it, it's not, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it, it, it's like sinister. Uh, but I think because we have to tell the story of America, we tell this story and we, we group people together and we talk tend to talk about groups as if they're this monolithic, unchanging, everybody uh, that is in this group is exactly the same. And so we tell the story of slavery where, you know, uh, like, you know, it's, you know, it's, all black people are enslaved and uh, which the majority of them are, there's about 4 million, uh, you know, slaves in America, a little less than that in the early 1800s. But by the time we get to the civil war in the 1860s, about 4 million slaves uh, in America. And so the, you know, there's a handful of, uh, of free blacks, primarily in the North, but also in the South. Uh, But we, we tell this story like white people have enslaved, uh, African Americans, and and I mean that that is true, that is true, but that doesn't mean that all uh, white people participated in that, right? Uh, it is you know uh, most white people in the North are ambivalent to slavery, uh, which means that they they you know it doesn't really affect them. It's something that happens down there in the South. Uh, and so they kind of just don't think about it very much, and, and which is wrong, right? I mean, it's an evil that needs to be addressed. Uh, but there are large portions of uh, the North, uh, white people in the North that are actively trying to end slavery. Uh, the abolitionist movement is very strong in the North. Uh, it's not a small number of white people in the North. Uh, there's always been white people that have p- opposed slavery ever since uh, the founding of, of America. And I think Charles Grandison Finney is, is one of those guys. And I think as history teachers and as uh, intellectuals, uh, we do a, a disservice by not making sure that we are clear that when we're talking about issues like this, that it is more complicated than just, you know, uh, white people enslaved black people. Uh, you know, that is true. That is true, but it is complicated. And, and uh, understanding the, uh, the, the minutia and the, the details here is, is vitally important. So Granderson Finney uh, spends his life uh, at Oberlin College, essentially telling people that they should uh, reform themselves, that will help them reform society. And he uh, starts preaching that all across the, the country. Uh, there, are other pre- there are other people uh, like uh, Lyman Beecher, uh, who are, is going to spread that message as well. The Beecher family is going to be very important. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, one of his daughters, is, is going to go on to write Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which is going to go a very long way in explaining to those ambivalent white people that we were talking about in the North, the ones that just kind of don't think about slavery. Uh, It's going to be uh, Lyman Beecher's daughter who's going to expose to them how evil slavery it is, uh, slavery is, and it's going to turn a lot of those Northern white people against uh, slavery. So uh, Lyman Beecher, this guy right here, he helps to evangelize the West. He raises a family that is going to be, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, active in trying to reform America. Uh, he believes that if you want your country to be good, the first place you should start is yourself. Uh, man, wow, words of wisdom, right? Uh, none of us, you know, not myself uh, or, you know, you or anybody else really has the power, not the president of the United States or, or anybody, really has the power to change the world, Right. But if we all just focus on trying to be the best person we can be individually, wow, the world will change. And that's what Lyman Beecher says. He says, you want to make a difference, a real difference in the world, change yourself first. 
right? Change yourself first and, and you know, that, that'll do it. And then you'll be the example that other people will follow, right? Don't focus outside first, focus inside first, and then focus uh, on the outside, right? He believes that people, I mean, just like, you know, many Protestants today believe that people are sinful, uh, but that through, you know, uh, you know, faith and good works, you can redeem yourself. Uh, he believes in volunteerism, right? If you're trying to be a better person, once you can, uh, you know, accomplish that, that, that inner uh, kind of uh, uh, reform, uh, you should go out and volunteer, you know, help teach kids how to read, you know, uh, help build your local school, you know, uh, go out and you know, uh, try and, you know, join a temperance movement that we'll talk about later that, that it will expose kind of the evils of alcohol, right? Uh, and he thought that the West was the key to these reforms. And the reality is it's because the West is this kind of like wild area that needs to be settled and tamed that no one person can kind of do that on their own. Right. When you go out to the West, you're going to have to go out there. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to, uh, you know, uh, be productive and you're going to need help. And these societies out West that are being built, there's a lot of this kind of communal or in this together kind of mentality. Uh, and he thinks that that's where the real reform will start. Right. I mean, if I move out you know, into the wilderness, you know, me and a handful of other, other people, if we don't work together, right, if we don't cooperate, then, you know, we're just not going to survive. And so, you know, the West kind of creates that we're all in this together mentality. Like I said, uh, his daughter, Harriet Beecher, she will get married, Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, will write Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which is a seminal, uh, abolitionist work. Uh, it is a piece of fiction. So it's, uh, it's not a true story. Uh, you know, the Harriet Beecher is, is actually really not an expert on slavery. Uh, you know, she's kind of, I wouldn't say had a sheltered life, but, uh, you know, she, she kind of, she tells a story, uh, you know, mostly based on stories that she has heard, uh, and, you know, actually ends up being, you know, uh, pretty uh, accurate. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, she, she takes some liberties. Uh, but, you know, she tells this like harrowing story of, of a couple of uh, different slaves and, and how they, uh, you know, what their life is like and how brutal slavery is. And, you know, it becomes a bestseller in the United States. And so uh, it's that the, the thing that it does is it's not going to change really any minds of the people in the South that are in favor of slavery, right? They're, they're going to view it as, you know, bogus. Uh, but what it does is all those uh, you know, people, white people in the North that have never really thought about slavery because it doesn't really affect them. And you, you got to remember, you know, this is a time before cars. Uh, it's a time, you know, when travel, people just didn't travel. Uh, it's a time before television and radio and social media. And so, you know, most people were really only concerned with their daily activities and they didn't really, you know, unless you read a newspaper you know, you didn't really know what was going on in other parts of the country. And so, you know, the, the slavery was just a thing they didn't think about. Well, then when they read this book, all of a sudden it opens their eyes to, to the, the evil uh, uh, that is slavery. And it's going to take people who never really thought about it and it's going to turn them against slavery, which is, you know, a step in the direction to getting change, right? It's, it's education. Uh, you know, once you're educated about a topic uh, and you're, you find out that that topic is evil, uh, you are more likely to uh, want to oppose that. Now, uh, we also see uh, not just a, a religious movement that's predicated on reform, uh, we're also going to see an intellectual movement that is, uh, you know, uh, desirous of reform. And that intellectual movement are the transcendentalists. Uh, this is not a, a religious movement. This is an intellectual movement. Uh, you know, it's mostly philosoph philosophers and writers that are at the same time, are they're going to make intellectual arguments for why society needs to change. They tend to reject traditional religion. Uh, you know, uh, they 
have problems with, you know, the idea of, of, of predetermination and, and, you know, organized religion in general uh, as not promoting free thinking. Uh, and so the religious movement, much larger in America. Most people in America in the 1800s uh, are deeply religious Protestant uh, faith. Uh, but these intellectual thinkers, which is our, our, a smaller number of people, are important too because they provide kind of the rational, uh, logical side of why society needs to uh, reform. And so what transcendentalism means is it means rise above. Rise above means change. Right, rise above your position, rise above, uh, you know, just kind of your natural state, uh, and you know that to rise above requires change. Change is reform. So uh, they're advocating the same thing. They believe, you know, different than religious people. Religious people believe that we are kind of uh, tainted with original sin. Transcendentalists believe that humans are naturally good that we, we, you know, uh, that we come from nature and in nature, you don't see evil in nature, right? You can see violence, you can see, you know, but that, <clears throat> all of that stuff, you know, when you see those kind of actions, they're not moral violence. It's not immoral violence, right? It's, <clears throat> It's natural. Uh, it's you know uh, about food and territory and protection. And because we are uh, essentially animals, that we you know uh, that if we go back to our natural state, our state of nature, uh, then we will be uh, good and moral. Uh, and we'll have a good and moral society. The fact that we have moved away from nature, that we're moving into cities, we're not in a natural environment, that is going to make people behave in an unnatural way. And so the transcendentalists believe that you know the growth of cities, that what we see with the growth of cities is we see a growth in crime, we see a growth in poverty, and they say that's because we're not supposed to live stacked on top of each other. Right, we're not supposed to live in this area where there's a whole lot of people and not a lot of resources. Because when that happens, people start to compete for those resources, uh, and you know the 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 people at the top will have them, and the the rest won't. And those people that don't will get try to get a, the, their hands on those resources essentially by any means necessary. And you're going to start to see a rise in violence. Uh, and so that's not the way we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to live in those cities. We're supposed Supposed to live out in the countryside. We're supposed to live kind of spread out. We can still be communal, right? We can still have some semblance of society, but we're not supposed to have these big cities. We should be living out in the country, small villages at best, uh, and really be returning to nature. And we should look to nature for how to behave, right? You don't see murders in nature. Right, or at least the transcendentalists didn't believe that back then. I think dolphins murder for fun, but they didn't have that knowledge back then. Um, but uh, you know, you in, in their eyes, you don't see murder in nature. You don't see those uh, those kind of things. You don't see killing for fun, I should say, uh, in nature. Uh, and so we need to behave the way nature does. And you know, our problems with crime and 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 those kind of things will disappear. We need to be self-reliant. You need to be able to take care of yourself. Uh, that's part of living in nature, right? You got to be able to do that by yourself. You should try to be moral and you need to seek a meaningful life. And I think this is, guys, this is super important for everybody to hear. Seek a meaningful life. I think too often uh, we get caught up in thinking that life is about pursuing um, you know, these kind of frivolous things, right? You know, who can have the, the nicest car or, you know, who can have the most social status or, you know, who's got the best Instagram page or all of that. None of that is really meaningful. And what we are kind of, what we're figuring out now is none of those things, if that's what you make your life about, none of those things are really going to make you happy. Right. I mean, there are all kinds of studies out there that say after a certain amount of money, uh, more money doesn't make you happier. Uh, you, and and the, the reason for that is a little bit of money makes you happy because it provides you security. Right. And security is important to be happy. Right. But 
anything more than a middle class life, you are not any more likely to be happy because happiness doesn't come from the things you have or the things you get. It actually comes from responsibility. The more responsibility you take on, the more meaning you have in your life, right? If you're, you know, uh, if, if you take on the responsibility of having a family and raising children, that provides you meaning. At the end of the day, man, if you're taking care of your kids, right, you just every single day it can be rough it can be hard i'm sure but at the end of the day you did something worth doing and that will make you happier than any car and that's what the transcendentalists are talking about they're talking about you gotta have meaning right i'm a teacher you know i'm a middle class guy i'm 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 blessed to be middle class and and i i appreciate that but that's not what makes me a happy person what makes me a happy person is that i'm a teacher man i get to talk to kids every day and maybe 29 of them in my classroom might hate me uh because i make them do homework and i'm give them tardies if they're not in class on time but man that one kid that comes to me and says you connected with me and I hated school until I had you. Uh, and you know, now I went on and whether I went on to college or to the military or to be a police officer or whatever, uh, you know, you, you really helped me focus. That makes me happy, right? It's that responsibility I have to kids is what gives me meaning in life, right? And that's what the transcendentalists are talking about. Uh, that you got to have uh, responsibility. You got to have, you got to do something meaningful uh, that uh, will, that will ultimately make you a happy, fulfilled person. Uh, don't focus on, you know, back then it's not cars, but don't focus on the, you know, just making money, right? Uh, make some money to be secure, but don't focus just on that. Don't focus on, you know, having the biggest house and and don't focus on those things. Focus on responsibility, focus on living a meaningful life. uh, And that's, what's going to make you happy. Seek the truth, right? Uh, Don't just, you know, don't just believe things because it feels good to believe things. Uh, You know, don't go through life with, with, out caring about what is true, right? You you have an obligation if you're going to live a moral and meaningful life to really, uh, you know, seek the truth, like find out, you know, what what is wrong with society, what needs to be changed, uh, and you know, just because you feel a way doesn't mean you should think a way, right? Uh, and and you shouldn't just be, uh, you know, uh, ambivalent and say I don't care. You should try to find out you know what is true what's going on in the world how can i make it better you know uh and if you if you do those things you'll make yourself more moral uh you'll make society more moral uh and the world a better place now the leader of the transcendentalist movement is a guy by the name of ralph waldo emerson uh emerson he's a writer he's a lecturer you know, a a philosopher, a poet, uh, and, you know, he really is all about, you know, individualism, right? And, uh, you know, that the, uh, it's the the individual is the most important part of society. And, you know, uh, I think sometimes we lose sight of that, you know, uh, that, that if you want to protect, uh, you know, the, you know, people, anybody, whatever, we're all individuals. And so uh, the individual, all, uh, you know, the the government should uh, be protective of the individual, but also uh, the individual is the one that is responsible for change. The uh, individual is the one responsible for creating a moral society. You know, nothing happens if it doesn't at least originate on an individual level. Uh, He believes that we have to find truth in nature, that uh, if you want want to uh, live a better life, you need to go out, you need to observe nature, you need to be in our natural habitat, and you need to learn how to live uh, based on, uh, you know, kind of what the way nature tells us to live. Uh, And, you know, I mean, these guys are some of the first, like, you know, environmental conservationists. Uh, They're very important uh, in that. 
And uh, Emerson is really going to start what is viewed as the American Renaissance, right? The, the you know America uh, up until now doesn't really have a reputation for great philosophical thinkers. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of uh, you know just philosophical thinkers, deep thinkers uh, in America. Uh, we don't have a lot of truly American literature, uh, and you know we're going to see a boom of uh you know american thought and american literature during the transcendentalist movement one of the other biggest transcendentalists is going to be a guy by the name of henry david thoreau thoreau writes uh a book that i really struggle with uh reading because it's uh it's a naturalist uh book and so it's very descriptive about trees and temperatures of the pond and whatever, uh, a book called Walden. And so uh, the, the, I challenge you, uh, you know, it, it's an important book to read, but it is a tough book to read because of just how descriptive he is about things that I'm just not going to lie to you are kind of boring. Um, he's descriptive about trees and insects and bugs because he's a naturalist. He's a, you know, a kind of, it's a, you know, Kind of a, an older version of what a scientist is before we get the science that we think of today uh and so you know remember they're they're discovering things for the first time and so describing trees and insects and temperatures of ponds all that is adding to scientific knowledge so when he writes this book he's trying to add to scientific knowledge but besides that what's important about this book is uh that he while he's writing he's pontificating on life and nature and and he really makes a pretty strong argument for living a simple life that you know the idea of if you're living in the city and and, and it's it's fast paced and there's you know it's manufacturing and it's all that kind of stuff uh the that it's it's really making people unhappy you know and we know that today right i mean the the you know the more you're on social media you know the more you compare your life to others the less happy you are and so you know Henry David Thoreau way before all of the you know modern technologies and stuff that are really giving us you know uh, you know serious issues with depression and anxiety Henry David Thoreau came up with the solution to that it's live simply right uh, don't don't try and chase those things find happiness in uh, in other places in nature uh, and in just living a good moral life um, you know this a life of uh, you know solitary living reading thinking writing those things will give you fulfillment uh, you know the seeking of truth he is a pacifist. Uh, he will oppose war with Mexico. Most Americans at this time are very expansionist, and we'll talk about the Mexican-American War uh, in a lecture later on down the road. But uh, he opposes war with uh, with Mexico. And again, transcendentalists, remember what they think. It, it's not just uh, this idea that you can oppose something, but you can't be indifferent about it. You have to rise above the situation individually, and you have to help society rise above things. So if he's a pacifist that opposes war, he's also going to believe that he has an obligation uh, to do something about that. And so uh, what he does is he's going to refuse to pay his taxes because those taxes are uh, being used to fund a war that he thinks is immoral, right? I mean, pacifists, he believes that all wars are immoral, particularly the Mexican an American one. And, and I don't know that he's not wrong. Uh, you know, we, uh, we kind of instigate that war and we'll, we'll talk about it later and we, we do it so we can expand, uh, you know, which is not unheard of back then. I mean, America's not the only country doing that. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, the idea that countries don't attempt to expand is an incredibly modern uh, belief. But you know, uh, Henry David Thoreau was was early in recognizing that that is wrong. And so he refuses to pay his taxes. Uh, and then uh, because those taxes are supporting the war and then he's going to write about it uh, and he's going to write what, an essay called Civil Disobedience. This is seminal. This is so important to American thought because it's going to be used later on down the road by guys like Martin Luther King uh, in the civil rights movement. And the idea behind civil disobedience is this. That if you believe in a democracy, if you sometimes in a democracy, the majority rules, right? 
And so when the, the majority can be wrong, and this is a thing that we, you know, we 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 have to talk about in democracies. Uh, you know, it's a you know we have checks and balances in the system because our founding fathers recognized there is a tyranny of the majority. That if the majority, uh, you know, always gets its way, it can oppress the minorities. And so we have these checks and balances in the system, but sometimes things will slip through. Sometimes the majority is wrong. And so Henry David Thoreau says, if you recognize that your government has passed an unjust law, and the key is unjust law, not a law that you don't like, but an actual unjust law, then you have an obligation not to follow that law, to peacefully not follow that law right? Not rise up, not, you know, violence, because in a democracy, we have ways to solve these problems. What he says is, look, you know, uh, if, if a law is unjust, then you have to just say peacefully, I'm not going to uh, abide, abide by that law. And that's a form of protest. It draws attention to the, to the subject. And if you're right, and you got to be right here, but if you're right, other people will see it and it will snowball. And that's exactly what happens in the civil rights movement. So Dr. Martin Luther King, who you know saw unjust laws in the Jim Crow South, and he said, you know what? These are unjust. And he starts a peaceful movement to change those laws. Because to get those laws changed in, in America in, or in any democracy, you got to get the majority of people uh, to agree with you. And you can, you know, really history shows that that only happens when the civil disobedience is nonviolent, right? It takes time, right? It doesn't happen overnight. But real change happens when people point out unjust laws. They don't follow those unjust laws, but they do it in a peaceful manner because eventually the average person finds out about it and says, you know what, we've got to change that. And they go about changing it, right? Uh, when those uh, that civil disobedience is violent, what history shows us is that the average American, the voter, the one that actually makes change, uh, will reject the people that are uh, asking for change. And they're, they they just typically don't go along. Change almost always happens. And all the biggest, best changes, the 64 Civil Rights Act, uh, you know, the 65 Voting Rights Act, uh, all of those happened because of peaceful protests, right? Uh, I mean, modern times, uh, when uh, protests go violent, what we have found is there's really not change afterwards. Uh, and so uh, Henry David Thoreau saw all that and writes it out in civil disobedience. You know, it's, you have an obligation to change these unjust laws. And again, unjust, it doesn't mean that you laws you don't like, right? So, you know, say, I don't like to drive 55 miles per hour. I think I should be able to drive whatever I want. So I'm not going to follow that law. I'm just going to drive, you know, a hundred miles an hour, wherever I want. Well, is the speed limit an unjust law? No, it's justified because it's a minor inconvenience for me, the driver, and it saves lives, right? If I'm going 100 through a school zone, right, that's not a good thing. And so that law, he's saying, you got to follow that, right? That's democratically passed. It is just, uh, you got to follow it. But let's say, you know, uh, taxes for a war, may that be unjust? I don't know. I think some people think it's justified, right? You know, you got to have a military, you got to have protection. Some people might not. And in that case, right, because it is questionable, may, we probably need to have a conversation about it. And that's what civil disobedience does. It starts that conversation. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, future leaders like Martin Luther King are going to take this idea of civil disobedience uh, and they're really going to uh, run with it. All right. Uh, that is where we're going to leave off with uh, the lecture today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and we will uh, begin a lecture on the temperance movement uh, shortly. Thank you very much. And I will see you again soon.